Welcome to our latest episode of the Man at Arms series. In this episode, we will be talking about the English Civil War soldier. So there were two types of infantry during the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. We have the pikemen, but we also have the musketeer. Now here we're joined by Joe Bristol, very good friend of ours, and he is portraying an infantryman, a musketeer to be precise, of Lord Brooks Regiment. So this is the very start beginning of the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. So let's take a closer look at the kit and equipment that he's got. So starting with his headwear, we have a wide brimmed hat here. You can see the, the band he's got round it. It's very typical of the sort of headwear worn at the period. You will see a multitude, a myriad, or even a plethora of different types of headwear being worn uh, during the 1640s especially. But here we have the wide brimmed uh, felt hat as it's known now. But moving down, we'll see his, uh, his jacket, if you will, is actually a doublet and it's made from linen, very, very cheap to produce, very lightweight, breathable, and even today, a fantastic clothing item to wear on a warm summer's day. Over that, he wears a belt around his waist, which has a pouch on, as well as a bollock dagger. Uh, so this is really moving uh, into the mid 17th century now, of course, but these daggers were used primarily in the medieval period, but were very functional and very useful items. He also has a, a, a sword, or in this case a tuck, which is a very short, um, cheaply made uh, sword. That's uh, suspended by a baldric over his right shoulder. And on his opposite shoulder is his collar of boxes, or more commonly known nowadays as a bandolier. So he has a number of wooden bottles which contain measured charges of gunpowder inside. He has a shot pouch which sits on his right hip. Below that suspended is a priming bottle, so that's for priming the pan. He also has a little metal bottle, a little pewter bottle, which contains oil for oiling his musket. And moving round to the back of our model, we have what's known as the snapsack. So this is essentially a piece of leather that's sewn up on one side with a strap, which goes over the shoulder and tied at the top. And this is where we keep his daily items in, such as uh, cutlery, if he's lucky enough to have it, bowls, plates, change of uh, hose, uh, a shirt, and, and so forth, personal effects, if you will. Moving downwards onto his leg wear, he wears a pair of what are known as confined breeches, which means they are breeches which are uh, tied just below the knee. And underneath that, on his lower leg, we have uh, what are called hose. So these are knitted hose or stockings. On his feet, he wears straight, lasted, closed latchet shoes, typical poor man's footwear of the period. And of course, what makes him a musketeer is the fact that his firearm is a matchlock musket. So let's take a look at the matchlock musket, how it was loaded and how it was used during the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. The loading of a matchlock musket begins with the musketeer in this position, which is called give rest to your musket. He then opens the pan and cleans the pan, making sure it is clear of dirt and that the touch hole is not blocked. Using a priming bottle, he primes the pan with gunpowder before shutting the pan and then casting off loose powder and blowing off loose powder. Casting the musket about, the musketeer opens a charge and then charges the barrel with powder, followed by shot. The scouring stick is drawn forth, shortened, and the charge is rammed home. The scouring stick is removed, shortened, and then returned to the housing. The musketeer returns to his starting position of giving rest to his musket. He then draws forth his match. The match is cocked in the lock and is tested to be sure that it will strike the pan once opened. When the musketeer is ready to fire, he will guard and blow the match to make sure it is still burning. The order will then be given to present his musket. The pan is opened and the order to give fire is delivered. The musketeer dismounts his musket and uncocks his match. Having worked up an appetite, it was now time to join Pete and Danny in the kitchen 
and learn more about what the average soldier ate during the 1640s. So what was the soldier of the Civil War eating? Well, here's actually a small selection of the type of food that he would have eaten. Was the army issuing food to him? Not really. He may have been issued bread on a long march, but that's about as far as it goes. So who would be giving him the food? Well, it would be the local populace. So he'll be billeted in a house uh, with, along with his comrades, and it's down to the people that own that house to feed those soldiers. And they can't just go down to the supermarket. So whenever a soldier came into town or an army came into a town or a city, the local populace absolutely hated it because they'd literally eat them out of house and home. Because you can't just go down to the supermarket like we can today. They've got to keep, they've got to keep on being forward thinking. So we're using a lot of preserved food. So, so we've got seasonal vegetables here. So at the time of us filming this, this is what would have been available to them because they were actually growing vegetables in their garden. So they, you know, they are quite self-sufficient in certain ways. Uh, fresh meat is a premium and also a luxury as well. So a lot of cured meats such as bacon and things like that. And, and quite grain heavy as well. So poultry doesn't really come into it. That's a, that's a, that's a, a wealthy food. However, chickens could be kept on the property. So eggs are quite big part of the normal person's diet during that time period. So I said with the cured meats as well. So, these, so if he knows the tail eating, where they'll take everything out of the animal, stuff it, spice it, put it in an intestine casing and cure it in a fireplace. And also herbs and spices. So depending on how rich you are, depending on what herbs you've got, but you've got a very small selection. So if you want to look at feeding during the 1640s and you want to know the sort of flavours they've got, where you've got mustard seed, pepper, ginger, cumin, cinnamon, nutmeg so it's quite a moroccan kind of theme that we've got going mm. on here so if you want to know taste the flavors of the uh, civil war period go with moroccan spices herbs and spices you ain't you're not going to go that far wrong so being peasants or or the people of the lower <laughs> lower, <laughs> order, or lower orders grains grains are a big part of your diet so you've got barley oats and bread. So you're probably eating about two pounds of bread a day. So it'll usually be like this, so it'll be brown, like normal brown bread or rye bread. So rye bread you still get in the supermarkets then they say, you know, this is good stuff to eat. But white bread is for the rich. So it's only the wealthy that are going to be eating white bread. Or if you're a private soldier, it's if you've raided a baggage train or something like that. <laughs> Fruit. They did eat fruit. Uh, these are British plums, blueberries, raspberries, uh, blackberries. Sorry, and these are actually in season at the moment, so they could look, they could forage for these things. So if you're, so if you've had an army come into your town or your settlement, and you've had soldiers billeted with you, what are you going to do? Because you're, because you're, it's actually down to you to feed them. So you would provide them of all your food. And the army would reimburse you. So there'd be like a, a liaison officer would go around and give you money to feed the soldiers. But the problem with that is, is because they're thinking ahead, you know, preserving oats, meats, vegetables. So dried vegetables are very, very common. But when they're in season, they'll eat them fresh. But then they've got to be thinking, hang on a minute, we're going to need to dry these so we can eat them during the winter. But now an army's come in, They've taken out your entire winter stock or the stock that you're building up for winter. Um, so yeah, so what are we going to make for our soldiers that have just rocked up in town? Mm -hmm. Well, bacon. So let's get the bacon out. So bacon is the most common food source because it's easy to preserve. It's salted. They can do what they like with it. So bacon and gammon is the most common meat of the working man. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a pottage. Right, so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to start prepping the bacon first. So what kind of, like, is there anything special about this bacon? Is it just typical bacon off the shelf or is it some form of preserved? Yeah, well it's their, it's their shelf, um, if you know what I mean. It, mm. it, 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 so it's salted and cured, like, like you get bacon from the supermarket okay. today. So mm. you like your gammon, your bacon, but obviously their process is that they'll have it, it won't be in a fridge, it'll be hung up. Right. So would it be 
necessarily like smoked and salted yeah. or both? Or? Yeah, it would be, yeah. So you would salt it, that was their way of curing it. Um, they could smoke it as well, so they'd hang it in the chimneys. Mm -hmm. So that just offset it like they do with smoking kippers. Um, it's making me hungry. It's oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of Mayor, the old pictures of the old butchers where you used to have all the produce hung outside on the big, and some of the old buildings you still, yeah. still want the hooks. Yeah. From showing all these fresh and cooked meats. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Especially now with the, the resurgence of the heritage breeds as well, which is great to see, you know. Yeah, Gloucester All Spot needs to be a big comeback of the Gloucester All Spot. <laughs> in fact, it's a nice link in with where we are now. So we're at uh, Middleton Hall, in, uh, just inside Warwickshire, near Tamworth. And the gentleman who lives uh, here at the hall in the 19th century, uh, surname of Law, I think it's Francis Lordy, if memory serves me well. He's actually credited with um, sort of creating the uh, breed of the um, of the, the Sundayback, uh, which is a Tamworth pig, also known as, which is pretty awesome. He was oh, gifted a, uh, I think it was an Indian boar, and they bred mm. it with a local pig, and they ended up with mm. the uh, the Tamworth pig, the Sundayback. So that's interesting. Yeah. Isn't it? So whenever you they should keep, they should keep yeah. some here. Yes. Yeah. Well, suggestion to the management. Who knows what the future holds? <laughs> you know. Oh, it's, it's all yeah. happening. Uh, it's all happening here. I've done my fire training. We're fine. Yeah, yeah. Cook so what I'm going to do first? I'm just going to whack this in because what I want to happen is, is I want the fat to sort of render itself off. Okay, so not using any oil or anything? We're just no, they did it. use lard and things like that, but we're just, you know, you're just thinking, yeah. you know, going that mindset is that like I've got 20 soldiers now living in my house. <laughs> you know, I'm going to do everything sparingly. I'll probably cut this a bit too, <laughs> to be honest. You can't, you can't send them down the local kebab house. We can't no. send them down the local kebab house, no. <laughs> so, yeah, so we, so this is what, so we just go, let this render down, so the old fat just starts with that. We'll bang the onions in, we'll put some vegetables in there. So let's just turn that down. So no, no oils or anything like that? It's just well, yeah, so I just say, they would use lard, dripping and things like that, but because there's a lot of fat in it, it's mm. belly bacon anyway, so a lot of fat's mm. gonna mm. render itself out of that. And also, do we stir that PP to make it the next bit of ready? Sorry? Do we stir that for you? Or you yeah, yeah, just give it a gentle stir. Do you want to burn on your best yeah, pan? Yeah, yeah the, best be camp, the best camping pan. I just want a bacon sandwich now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that smells awesome. I know. So the question begs to be asked, where have you, got, where have you found this recipe from, Pete? So these recipes, or the inspiration of this one, has actually come from a chap called uh, Stuart Peachy. He has basically spent the last 40 to 50 years um, just researching life of the of this time period, and he's done some fantastic books. So if you want to start learning about the English Civil War, he's done drink, food, dying and tanning, life of the soldier, and this is like about almost 50 years worth of work that he's put into it um, to make these uh, books absolutely well worth the money. They're about £40 a book, 30 to £40 a book, but yeah, well worth the money. I really could eat one of them. So no spices yet? No spices yet. No, we'll, we'll save that to the end. Or about a little way through. Is this, is this your first time making it or have you made it before? No, before this is, the, well, I've done something similar for us before. I did the rabbit, didn't I? Oh, so this is sort of the similar lines to when I did the rabbit at that oh, event over at uh, Avery Croft. So it's, it's along those similar sort of lines, but the, obviously the vegetables are a little bit different because of different season, because mm. when we were doing it. So, <laughs> so you see, look, the fat's rendering out there. Oh, so you see, if you'd have had, uh, so that had just been absolutely swimming in fat if we, so, that, so these little pods, so those of you at home that have never seen one before, this is a pea pod, they do not come in pl big plastic bags in a frozen aisle. So that's what the peas come in. There we are, little, little pea pods. So peas are in season at the moment. So like I said before, some people would actually grow these in their mm. garden. The job of the children to de -pod the peas. It, it would be a job to de-pod the peas. And of course we're the same two peas in a pod yeah, called yeah, yes. there is more than two peas. So get them onions in there. In with the onion. In with the onion. Not finely diced, just a No, it's onion. just cut off and thrown yeah. in, just to give it a bit of, you know, of flavour to it. No tears yet. No tears yet. They're not bad onions, to be fair. Yeah, they're not strong. Not bad onions, I've never seen. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Is this, uh, what's in here, Pete? Well, that is going to be the finale of this. So we've put the vegetables in, so that's all sweating down. So what we'll do is we'll get some of our herbs and spices. So we'll get some of that mustard seed in there. Mustard seed times. Yeah, we'll put the mustard seed in. How many? Mustard well, seed. a couple of peaches I'll put in. Uh, we'll put the pepper in. Look at some of these spices would have been the same value as gold. You always say spices yeah. weigh the same as gold. You know, this is well, yeah. Thing. Well, yeah, they're luxury items. Like, things like salt. Salt's very readily available. That's quite mm -hmm. cheap. Anyone can afford salt. Uh, mustard seed is quite readily available. I don't want to put too much in there at the minute until we tasted it. Do you get quite a lot of saltiness off the bacon, sure? You do, well. yeah. That's yeah. why we don't want to put a lot of that in there. So, seasoning wise, we'll just leave that be for now. And then what we'll do is we'll start adding in the secret ingredient, which is cider. So, this is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, 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 so cider, you do find them cooking with it. They're drinking it and they're cooking with it. Obviously, this is more regional, so. Again, when I mentioned about them having to preserve stuff, so mm. once the apples are starting to go, they're like, well, what are we going to do with it? Well, we're going to make this, yeah, and same with pears as uh, well. Perry, so, perry, yeah, perry. perry. So they are, they're cooking it and they're drinking it as well. So they could be using water. Water supplies. Yeah, water you, supplies yeah. weren't clean, were they? Well, uh, yeah. If you're in a city, no, it's not going to be clean. Or if you're in a heavily populated town, it's not going to be clean. But if you're mm. somewhere like a village, they're, they are drinking more water out in the countryside, but it's not getting as, in, mm. you know, it doesn't get the toxins in it. And they are, they are boiling it as well. They're using it for cooking and things like that. Or they'll boil it first before they drink it. Good farming communities. Yeah. So this, is, this will be apple cider though? Yeah, so this is apple. Yeah, so this is, yeah, so this is scrumpy. This is. So we'll just let that boil for a little deglaze the bottom as well. Well, there's lovely juice. Look at that. Yeah, yeah. Gravy, form form really. gravy form at the bottom of that. Mm. It does seem heresy to cook with cider and not drink it, but we will allow it in this situation. Yeah. So should we go for a little, little, little close-up to see what's happening inside yeah, the pot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get, yeah. Have a little look inside. We're going to add in the pearl barley and the oats as well. Because remember, that's a lot of your, a lot of your mm. carbohydrates and things like that. So that is, that is now, all that needs to have done to it now is it just needs to have a simmer for about good hour hour and a half something like that with lid on with the lid on yep right so while we wait for this to uh, turn into something mm. edible i think you've got to go and see a pikeman i believe yeah so we're gonna have a look let's go have a nose so now we're joined by the other main element of the armed forces during the civil war and that is the pikeman here today represented by your friend and mine chris Chuckles Marks. As you can see, the clothing he's wearing is similar to our musketeer. It is his home civilian attire. They had no uniforms by that point. So he's still wearing his clothes from home. Agricultural, heavy duty clothing. You may notice he is wearing armor. At the beginning of the Civil War, the pikemen were near enough decked out in armor. He is wearing a quarter and a capacere. This is, you know, this is basically making him to a mini tank in an effect. He is well armored. Begin originally, he would have had plates down here, but on the march, access and ability he loses them over time and by the end of the civil war you see a lot of this armor been ditched again the numbers changed at the beginning of the civil war you had two pikemen to one musketeer by the end of the civil war it was the other way around showing how this piece of weaponry from prehistory has now basically even in that short period of time been resigned to the dustbin another piece of interesting thing is his sidearm we saw earlier with our musketeer, he was wearing an issue tower sword, but this sword is actually a trophy weapon that his father would have brought back from the Thirty Years' War. So quite interesting to see how these trophy captured weapons are being used. And basically, we need arms, bring your stuff from home. Other than that, you can see that the pike itself would be between 16 and 18 foot. There are stories of people cutting them down for pieces for firewood, but you know, if your friend has got, your opponent's got 18 foot and you've got 16 foot, you've got, <laughs> they got an advantage compared to you. Made of ash, is it a strong, bendable piece of weaponry and still very suitable for the day. Right, we are very ready, we're ready and raring to go, here we go. That's all, oh, that's it's the line of the cookout store, isn't it? It is, you know, isn't it? Come on, hurry up. 
Please, sir, can I have some more? Oh, there we go. Ooh, more. Look at that. So you see how thick it is? Oh, that's a proper you know, winter warmer. It, yeah, it's a winter warmer. It's, you know, it's going to stick you very to your ribs like, isn't it? Thank you, Chef. It smells great. Yeah, There's really a lot good. of green stuff in there. Well, you're well, well, you're well, 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 I think you've just got to like, uh, close your eyes oh, and pretend and dab it. Yeah. Think what your doctor would say. It's got a little scope on here for me and all. Chef's got to have some as well. Yeah. We can't forget our cameraman. No, no, we can't forget our cameraman who is also actually a chef on Chuckles. <laughs> he should be giving us a, a food he's, he's, he's been stood here staring at me the whole time we've been doing <laughs> this. He's like, yes. <laughs> giving me questionable looks. He's like Bake Off, you know, looking for me. There you go, going Chuckles. <laughs> so, right, right, right. let's. Are we going straight in or are we going to Oh, I'll tell you what. We need some yeah, so we've got, we got our bread, so we've got our rye bread and um, wholemeal bread as well. But let's wash it down with a little bit of ale. So this has been the staple drink. So this has been like small beer. So this was quite a dark one. So this is mm. their sort of strong beer. Excellent stuff. And you'll have that other jobs. You've run out of cups. Classy, easy, really classy. <laughs> And what we're working with bread wise, we've got rye bread. Yeah, and then cheers. Whole that's a, yeah, it's normal whole right. grain bread. Cool. So that's the sort of bread that they'd have been eating at the time. Yeah, so let's, sorry, oh, oh, let's get a bit of this on the ground. Enjoy, enjoy, James. Let's get in there. Straight for the meat. Straight for the meat. Mm. Never leave your meat. Never leave your meat. That's nice, actually. That's good. I don't mind if I said this actually, mm. like, I'm surprised. <laughs> <laughs> that's. It's quite sweet. That's what's from the cider, isn't it? I was just going to say, you, the cider is just, yeah. The cider and the fruit. bacon is masking the vegetable undertone, which is probably quite good for you. Mmm. Mm. And you know that the uh, bacon's cooked as well, because it's got that nice melted mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. texture to it. I want to try some of this rye bread, so it's all about. Mm. Europeans you still eat a lot of rye bread, don't mm. you? you kind of got that fashion in the UK. But it's still got very common. European, you see a lot of the European shops yeah. and aisles and stuff. So get back in, give it a try. It kind yeah. of smells. It's like, remember malt loaf you used to get as a kid, that pur mm. like purple cake? <laughs> just, sort of, just eat a bit of a dunking. Mm. Oh, yeah, but you're dunking with the other boys. It looks like a much gravy, is it? But it absorbs mm. quite well. Does it? Mm. It's like a bit dry on its own. Mm. Mm. I'll tell you what, if I was a soldier in the Civil War, I'd happily eat that. Oh, I would as well. No problem. And that's. that's good. You know, because really pottage, it's just a stew, it's just a thick stew. You know, that's all pottage is at the end of the day, uh, you know, with, be with, like, with beans or grains in it. Well, it's uh, been an absolutely fantastic day. I mean, we, we've learned so much mm -hmm. about Civil War. Oh, yeah. And I've come into this totally unknowing. Oh, yeah, this is my first ever filming of Civil War and learning, but I hope you guys out there have learned a lot more as well from mm. our experiences on. The man at arms. Absolutely, absolutely. I have to say, um, compliments to the chef. Yes. <laughs> Talking to the chefs, what does the chef think to it? <laughs> That's a thumbs, That's a thumbs up. up. That's a thumbs up. He's had a thumbs up. He's not going to come and have a thing. You're going to go, yeah, it's really good. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> we got a thumbs up. <laughs> well, Let's have a, a, anyway, a toast to our chef. Thank you very much. Well, I think that draws us up to a nice little yeah, close, I think. So that's not very often that we end the show with a meal and a beer. Yeah, well, it's not beefy boys, I'll drink is it? Well, well. I'll drink to that as well. <laughs> so if you've enjoyed what you've seen and you'd like to support us in what we do, please consider following us on Patreon or even subscribing and sharing to your friends to get the message out there. But until next time, keep history alive!